presented to you by Talking the Line Sports Media, a sports gambling podcast by betters for betters, connecting you with the brightest, sharpest, and most electric personalities in all the sports gambling industry. So as always, pull up a chair, open up your mind, and get ready to receive knowledge you won't find anywhere else. We can't thank you enough for joining us, and we hope you enjoy. This is Wise Words. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and beautiful gambling people joining us for episode number two of the Wise Words podcast. I am your humble host, Colton, Colt45 Soroka, and I can't thank you enough for choosing to stop by and get the best knowledge and insights on the market from the brightest and sharpest names in the sports gambling industry. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have one of the sharpest of the sharps on tap here today. I got to be honest, I'm a little bit starstruck because I was just watching this man on TV not even a year ago. I told him post our pre-production here and I'm so excited to talk to him live and in prime time. But before we do that, you guys know the drill. I need some help rowing the proverbial boat that is the Wise Words podcast gently down the stream and helping me do so the co-host of the Wise Words podcast, also the co-host of the Talking the Line podcast, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, the man, the myth, the degenerate gambling legend and TTL resident cheesehead himself, Mr. Riley, R. Max Magnuson. Partner, how you doing over there on that side of the screen today, pal? My man, I'm doing just, just fine, aside from, uh, you know, licking my wounds as a cheesehead over here. But, uh, hey, we've got a nice show on tap today. I'm excited to get talking to our guest and get some serious, serious, serious knowledge about uh, some topics that you and I hold dear to us. So I'm ready to get rocking and rolling, my man. Absolutely, my friend. Uh, time of recording. It is Monday night, so we got Monday night football coming up here. So we are going to make this short and sweet so we all have time to watch the action. So no hesitation, no delay. As always, my friend, friends, it's about time to bring in our second guest on Wise Words. Now, my friends, he is another professional sports better. He's an expert in all things sports gambling. And wouldn't you know it, most notably, in the world of NFL and college football betting markets. He also owns a wealth of knowledge in DFS and year-long fantasy. You can catch the majority of his content on his flagship YouTube channel, Bets TV, as well as his insights and analysis and much more across some of the major media platforms out there, most notably, again, VSIN, NBC Sports, The Action Network, and, oh, ESPN. There are shows up and down the sports gambling and sports industry in general that vie for this man's time. And we have the next 30 to 45 minutes with him and his big old brain. So help me welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, with my pleasure, the sports cheetah himself, Mr. Preston Johnson. What's up, guys? I think that was the most uh, impressive intro I've ever (laughs) had or heard on any podcast I've been invited on. So you, well uh, done. Yeah. I appreciate the uh, hype. If you want to get this man uh, smiling, that's exactly the type of stuff you need to tell him. I hey, uh, appreciate that's, his intro. So yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's what I do this for. And I mean all of that, Preston. Honestly, we cannot thank you enough for uh, helping us out here, being our second guest and uh, dropping down some wise words, if you will. Um, not really going to uh, waste any time. We'll get right into it. We know uh, time of recording. We obviously got Monday night football going on, so we got plenty of action to get into. Maybe we'll uh, even talk a little bit about that here today as well. But I will start things off here probably uh, about three or so questions from me, three or so questions from Mags over there. One thing I wanted to know, and I'm actually very, very interested in. Now, um, first things first, am I correct in saying you have a master's degree in sports psychology? Yes, that is true. I do. Okay, 
So I, I had kind of done a little research and I saw that. So I'm actually really, really interested to hear a little bit about that. I have a little bit of a background in psychology myself, and I am just completely fascinated by it. So now I'm even more intrigued that uh, you got the sports aspect to it. So kind of a two-parter question, where did you get your master's? And then what are some kind of some of the applications or ways you've been able to utilize it in now your day-to-day -day sports betting career? Sure. So I got the master's degree from the University of Utah. I uh, am from the West Coast. I did my undergrad in the state of Utah, and there weren't at the time too many master's programs on the West side of the United States. Uh, Utah is one of the few. So uh, it was easy for me to just transition there and 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 do that degree locally pretty much. I think I still had like a in-state tuition or whatever. It was it was right. cheaper. But uh, OK. Yeah, otherwise, I think you go to like SEC country, all those schools have it. I think University of Washington has added it now since uh, maybe okay. one or two other Pac-12 schools. But at the time, it was like Utah or, or go to the East Coast, and that wasn't in my uh, future. So anyways, yeah, that's what I did there. And how do I – I feel like I used it more as like a hip, like hyped – tag you don't really like learn anything that makes you a better, <laughs> better. sure I, i'll say you can learn stuff and if you study just psychology in general at all and my background initially was in poker stuff but like just the psychology of like being able to gamble i think is is relatively worthwhile in the sense that uh, you need to stay within a bankroll management what do you do and how do you react when you lose five games in a row because it's inevitable are you betting mm -hmm. three or four times what you should on the sixth game are you betting a game that you wouldn't otherwise bet like there's certain things there that i think psychology can play a role but uh, i've never claimed to like be able to watch a game and suddenly know what's going to happen um <laughs> sure. like live in real time or something <laughs> yeah. but but it was fun i didn't you know initially intended to uh work with a, a team and go that route i actually started my phd and then during that first year after my master's um i, I eventually said i don't want to do school anymore if i don't have to and i did sports betting and took that on full time but uh yeah the the intention was hey i can in order really like i did a psych undergrad you can't get any jobs with a psych undergrad you have to do a master's degree i always loved sports sure. and it just kind of fit um the mold so um, yeah, no, no secrets I can really share though that actually <laughs> solve sports betting or anything. Hey, either way, I absolutely love that though. Definitely something I was kind of intrigued to uh, learn about. So I appreciate that. Riley, what you got, man? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned something about bankroll management. I know from my small research, it seems like you are someone who typically does some volume betting uh, on sports that you know about. If correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, but do you have any? rules as far as a i mean strict money management as far as keeping away from those big losses because obviously if you have those big cards you you know you leave yourself open to having a, a a handful of losses as opposed to some small cards uh and you know colton and i also do quite a bit of volume betting on the sports we love but is it more so you know rules or do you are you just that confident in uh you know your strategies that you feel you're not going to be in those big holes so I think it's an important question to kind of assess yourself because um, like if, for example, if you don't know how to, like if you're not making your own projections or sort sure. of like looking at your own numbers and comparing them to the market, and then you can kind of see your underlying perceived edge relative to where your numbers are, where the market is. If you can't assess any of that and say like, hey, my edge here is 3%, my edge here though is 5%, mm -hmm. like you should bet accordingly to at least to some degree uh, most people, like 99% of people don't have like their own projections right. to look at or to even like calculate and quantify their edge. Sure. So it's a more nuanced question. If you actually are, then you probably know how to adjust your, your, your bet sure. sizing accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not, and you're just like placing wagers for fun and you're, you know, you're trying your best, you're reading, le learning stuff. Uh, I mean, honestly, it's maybe a little more on the conservative side, but I wouldn't bet more than like one to 2% of your bankroll on stuff. And then just like see how far you can go with it. But uh, ultimately, you know, back poker days, playing online, you'd like have a certain amount of a bankroll, you'd play certain stakes up to X amount of tables per hour, and you could like really like methodically break it down. And mm -hmm. so when I first started, I kind of did it similarly. And I think uh, limited my edge early on for what it's worth. So like it can go the other way too, where sometimes people are over betting or chasing or going crazy. But also if like you actually have something that you need to take advantage of it while it lasts because the markets are constantly getting more efficient they're adjusting. And so 
that's the key part is being able, if you have your own numbers, your own set of data points, you're able to compare them to the market and quantify some sort of edge that you see, uh, then you're on the right track. And then you can kind of go from there. And, and, and if you're not and you're just in over fun, I just would stay like, again, one to 2% of your sure. bankroll per bet. If you really love something, maybe go two to two and a half percent. If not, just stick around one, 1%. So that would be my advice. But uh, again, if, if you're in tune to, to how things are working from a market perspective and like modeling the sports yourself, then, you know, obviously that can be adjusted. Yeah, no, I would say it's a great answer because uh, you know, a large part of the audience we're reaching are people that don't have that type of access. So I think that's a great answer. Absolutely. And and that's actually something too, we're, we're working to get into more, obviously getting more into the professional side of things, work on our own projections and stuff like that. So maybe something we have to uh, pick your brain a little bit outside <laughs> of the show, not give away sure. any trade secrets. So uh, we'd love that. But Kind of uh, along that same track, you, you alluded at a few of the things and it kind of brought this to my mind and a question I kind of wanted to ask and I've asked our guests in the past. Now, if you had one big thing, the number one mistake that you see almost every better making, and I know you alluded to a few of them, maybe chasing or, or different things along those lines. What would you say that is? And not only that, but how would you go about counteracting that and fixing that and maybe the emotion is kind of tied into some of that, as you alluded to in the first question. Emotion definitely is tied into it. I think like, it's kind of along the similar lines. Like one of the main things is just going to be people that go crazy and chase. And like after a couple of weeks trying to bet college football, they don't have any money anymore. They have to work. They have to actually save up. Then they can try again. But it, it's just not a fun process to go through. Right. If you're betting 1% of your bankroll on every play, like even if you're absolutely awful, you're still going to like, that's going to last you like a couple seasons, probably like it just, right. it, it just, it just goes a long way and it's for fun. Right. And so people mostly just chase, I will say, and we, you kind of preface that last question prior with like the high volume. That's mm -hmm. one thing that I think a lot of people that maybe do have an edge or are trying to quantify stuff and compare to their personal numbers or projections and they're betting themselves, maybe don't bet as often also not only sizing but how frequently they're betting it goes back to yeah i'll have like 20 to 25 bets on a college football weekend that's because i think there's 20 to 25 edges some people i've like i think a lot of those that are just starting here like you can't bet 20 games and be profitable like that just right. doesn't exist it doesn't work uh, i mean if you have 20 edges you need to bet them you can't pass on edges like that's just like giving right. away money in a vacuum <laughs> long term so uh, I think for a lot of people that maybe are like, oh, I'm going to focus on my top three or top five bets. Maybe that that's probably better in the NFL. The NFL market's way sharper. But like for mm. college football or college basketball on a Saturday, if you're limiting yourself to like three or five bets, I think that's also a mistake the other way where maybe you're not betting as as much, not only size wise, but um, the sheer volume. Like if if you have stuff that's working at a really good rate on three to five games a Saturday, it probably works at a similar rate eight to 10 games on a Saturday or maybe even more, or maybe second halves or whatever it may be. So it's, it's kind of a uh, twofold in that sense where I think a lot of people are, are going too far, right? Because they're just chasing and they're not, they don't know what they're doing, but also people that I think are kind of getting into the mix and do have an edge, especially earlier in the week. If you're betting into openers that are weaker numbers, softer mm -hmm. numbers, don't be afraid to fire more than, you know, five bets on a college football Saturday. There's just, there's more value than that. If you went through and watched, opening line closing line for every side total on every game down the board you know like half of them move at least a couple points and some right. of them move even more like there's definitely value to be had just need to be able to find it um you don't want to leave it on the table though either awesome absolutely i appreciate that answer riley what you got my man yeah i mean i guess the last thing on that topic is there any point just whether it's entertainment for yourself is there any point where your emotion comes into play as far as plays are you are you almost 100 percent based off your projections analytics or uh you know your process that you stick to pretty much 100 percent. Okay. there's definitely a time i've like degen some bet before yeah. but then if, <laughs> when i do when i do that though it's like so small relative to yeah. like what my standard amount would be or like there's been times i've you know, I had a Saturday maybe where I was like 14 and three going into the right. Hawaii game. And I was like, I can't lose. Right. I'm unstoppable. <laughs> right. So I bet the Hawaii game sure. for fun, for small, just to like end the night in a sure, good, sure. good mood or a good vibe. But like, really, like it's, it's not common. Yeah, I went to, I went to a Dodgers game a couple of weeks sure. ago and I had, I, you know, I, I bet a few hundred bucks on the Dodgers game just to have some sure. action while I was there, but it's, it's never anything significant it's kind of pretty methodical at this point for sure awesome 
Uh, well, keeping it moving and keeping it right along, you keep hitting on college football and NFL. So I gotta, I gotta make a quick pit stop. Now I know, I know NFL is kind of definitely your expertise in an area that you target a lot. Um, now I know you could kind of go a lot of ways with this question, but maybe some key trends, maybe some key insights, anything that is really jumping off the page at you as far as key takeaways for week one, uh, from the NFL season so far. No, there's never like some like blind, you have to do this now after seeing one week of games. If anything, right. and I probably wrote about this when I was at ESPN the last couple of seasons. Uh, generally, if anything, the market overreacts to what you see after one game. And a lot of people, it's hard to process what you see as being like in, in reality, a, a 16 or 17 game season this year is a really small sample, let alone one game and like 60 minutes of playing this game. Sure. Like, one or two plays swing so much can be like like two plays can be a 28 point swing and like that just changes so much on your perception right. of what a final score is and so that one main thing would be balancing like your eye test what you see relative to like look the market uh projections and anticipation or value of a team entering the season is going to be pretty good pretty sharp mm. um, going forward throughout the season now there's obviously certain teams that overachieve there's some that underachieve but like when you have three and a half point moves after week one and there's no injury, like the Jacksonville one's a good example against Denver. It's ugly as can be, but like you can get plus six and a half now at home on the Jaguars against Denver. That line would have been like three probably yeah. before uh, everyone saw Jacksonville get slaughtered by the Texans. Mm. It hurts, but like, I mean, that's probably some value there. I'm not sure if that's going to be going up any higher. It's kind of one that's just been moving up. So I'll probably wait and see if it somehow touches seven, but um, that's just one, like that's a pretty big overreaction. The Falcons now are getting 13 against Tampa Bay after they got crushed by uh, the Eagles at home. Mm. Falcons were a team. I actually was relative to market pretty high on going into the season. So mm. the main thing is not to overreact too heavily. I think week one, no specific trend. That's like, Hey, underdogs won at a great clip. Therefore underdogs are going to win at a great clip in week two. That just doesn't usually uh, play out the same way every week. In general, though, what does historically tend to happen is we'll see overreactions after the first game or two in the NFL market, and there's value kind of going against some of the uglier teams that uh, looked poor or fading teams that just, like, you know, had kind of some fluky, weird wins and, and box scores that didn't really line up. And so you kind of have to dig and find those gems. But, uh, yeah, it works out, and there's going to be opportunities there. Awesome. I was wondering if that's kind of the direction you were going to go or not. We our, our theme of our daily show today was just overreaction. Everybody overreacting left, right, and center. And and that's that's kind of what you got to keep in mind. And I'm glad that's where you took it is just, yeah, there's certain things you can draw. And mainly, you mentioned it, the eye test. It's It's got to be in correlation with where the lines are and where what you're seeing out there. So, yeah, I uh, 150% love that answer. So, what, what you got again, my man? Yeah, I guess kind of building off that a little bit. Um, you know, whether it's football, basketball, or baseball, do you typically stay away a little bit more on, you know, the first week or two of the season? Uh, because I know I, especially last year with football, or not football, excuse me, uh, the NBA and MLB, the first couple of weeks, you know, I, I like to think what I, I know what I'm going to see. And those maybe are a little bit more of, uh, you know, the first couple of games don't matter as much on an 82, 160 game schedule as opposed to an NFL uh, or college football schedule. So do you typically kind of stay away until things kind of iron themselves out and you kind of know, uh, you know, what to expect from these teams? Or do you feel like you have a good grasp coming into this every type of season? I think if, I mean, if you're doing the work and you're preparing, you want to hope that you have a good grasp. And so sure. you want to trust what you had going into the year. Uh, I attack, I don't know, I'd have to look. If you guys don't mind, I have it on my phone. No, okay. yeah, go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll check my week one college football slate, for example. Sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's what we mean by volume betting. <laughs> yeah, so tw I had 20 bets week one. Sure. Uh, I think I had 19 week two. Like, sure. I'm just okay. firing away. Yeah, like, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I edge, I'm going to bet it, and I trust that sure. you know my okay. stuff's going to be better than um, – the early, early season markets, you know, macro view. I'll say this historically outside of one season, which was coincidentally last year, my college football through the first eight weeks of the season performs remarkably better than weeks nine through 15 market catches up. My volume usually cuts in half more or less. And I probably am a slight winner, but closer to break even weeks 
maybe it's 10 through 15 to end the college football season. So look, the market gets more mature and it's better. So you definitely don't want to leave weeks one or weeks two like off the table either, okay. just because I think there are sure. definitely some opportunities early in the season if you're just more right on a team than the market. And especially in a league like college football where there's so many teams, so much transferring between not only players, but coaches and offensive defensive coordinators, right. which changes like how teams are performing from a totals perspective. Like for years, you could probably just blindly bet the first few weeks, every offensive coordinator change where like some guy that was going at high pace goes into a new school and the market opens like a touchdown too low because they forgot, oh, this guy's going to run with more pace now for this school. And like the market would just move seven points on a total right. and you would profit. It's a little less uh, easy to do that now. Um, they've got a little smarter on like pretty basic stuff like that. But those are the types of edges or angles you can find or at least try to exploit um, early in seasons when you have maybe more info than the basic market does. Sure, fair enough. Awesome. And kind of a segue off of kind of the information the market has and stuff along those lines. And this is kind of along the lines of sports gambling become legalized state by state. Now, I know more you being in the West, it's been obviously Las Vegas is sports gaming capital of, of America, right? And then obviously it started to branch out. But what are your thoughts overall on um, sports gambling becoming legalized state by state? Is it better as it more kind of a niche with more some of the experts the sharps just betting it or in a way with more quote-unquote experts in the publics and everybody coming out of the woodworks do you maybe sometimes see better lines or are there some advantages that could potentially come from that someone asked me about this on my, my daily show that i do oh, awesome. he was he was wondering like uh how did he phrase it it, it was he basically was wondering if it was more of like does the public now that there's so many states that offer betting right mm. is the public going to affect the point spreads and the movement yeah more now than it used to and my general answer was like probably not like the books just aren't moving to joe schmo betting sure. whatever it may be if this maybe if some like high roller pits player gets cleared to bet half a million on a game even though he knows nothing about sports then they'll probably move to balance some of their action and maybe even hope for some action after they sure. move it a half point or a point. Like there's some cases where it can exist, but you're not going to find too many spots where the public's going to influence the market too heavily. So now they have, you know, 20 plus states that are offering these lines. The only thing I think that really comes as a benefit there is that you will see a few of the smaller states, like this happened in Oregon initially. I remember when they opened uh, their first, they had like two places in the whole state that even you could even bet at, and they played Oregon played Auburn in football week one a couple of years ago, and the price to bet on Auburn was like three points better there than anywhere else. So right. that yeah. subset of like two bucks, if you sure. lived in Oregon, because everyone's betting Oregon, they were just moving up. Now what they were able to learn after a few weeks, they finally like hired someone or heard like, hey. You probably shouldn't offer people that actually know what they're doing all this free money offering Auburn at plus four and a half when the line should be pick. You should just book all the action at like say minus one and a half, maybe a little shade, mm. but just book everyone's uh -huh. local organ action and then you'll probably just profit anyways. Like you're getting right. minus one ten. <laughs> right. So they they learned their lesson, but like you might find some new. I think there was a thing in Montana last college basketball season. They were doing openers the night before on certain conference games that Montana is in mm. and they wouldn't move them either. And they, sometimes they were like four or five points off. Hey, like, I love me some big sky basketball. There you go. So, like, <laughs> so if you're following big sky, like you have an edge there, but you have to live in Montana or know someone in Montana. Right. right, right. And I think if like after one guy, I know bet I think two or three of them and then they cut them off and then his limit was like a hundred bucks. So oh, it's, it's all like in the end, it doesn't change a ton. I think it's good for the general public just to have more options and more, you know, localized opportunities sure. but uh it's not going to really change the market outside of maybe some rogue sp uh, stuff you know state to state now kind of flip side to that coin before i kick it back to you riley now do you think that it's almost going to create an edge in a way for the books like do you think they're going to become more profitable because more public just influxing in or do you think eventually that the public will kind of start getting a little more prevy with everybody having access to left right and center trends this that and the other I don't think that'll influence too much. Maybe it influences like the early markets. Like if you watch a show on Sunday night that covers the NFL, for example, I'm not sure if you guys follow Drew and Whale from Deep Dive Podcast yeah. and they yeah, stream yeah. a lot. They're great at the NFL. They do, uh, except they're in Vegas, so they didn't actually do it last night, but they generally do like a week before recap, look ahead at the openers 
and whatever they say Sunday night, right after a few hours after the numbers open, like people will follow along and it'll move. And if it's wrong, it'll just move back eventually that week. If it's right, sure. then they're right and they got a good number. But theoretically, like the that that like public sentiment that it's getting more privy to information and betting, and even in the cases like Drew Andy where they're going to be right more often than not, hmm. um, it's 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 not going to be so significant that it's like game changing and limits open up quite a bit more Monday and then they open up even more in the week for people like Wednesday, Thursday, and then Sunday morning. Like it just kind of is like an increasing market in that sense. And um, I really just don't think the public's going to affect lines much at all. Maybe there's a case I'm, I'm not like seeing yet that does happen (laughs) outside of like the rare localized look, everyone in Oregon's betting Oregon and the book didn't know what to do. And they just happened to offer Auburn at a good price. And I think that happened the next week against Nevada. And then by the third week, they like they figured out what was going on so it's like the window is also super small even in those cases so yeah i don't know you're right the, the public might just be generally a little sharper sure but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that books are going to move to that information right away right. or or heavily gotcha awesome riley if you would sir yeah so i was i popped in for uh, a minute a couple hours ago to your live show and you had a caller asking about uh, eagles falcons and I, I believe you were alluding to the possibility that maybe it's not the falcons maybe the eagles are just that good how we saw yesterday i i don't know how to feel about it because like you i mean you said it earlier on the our show that you had some high hopes for uh for, for the falcons and i think colton and i did as well is there a world in which uh, the NFC East keeps churning out a new division champ and it's uh, the team that maybe we least expected in the Eagles here? That was my way of trying to save face on what looks like <laughs> awful Atlanta discussion. But, like, look, I'll just pretend like we didn't see week one for a second. Okay. Arthur Smith, like, absolutely turned around the Tennessee Titans offense. He mm-hmm. has historic red zone touchdown conversion rates for the Titans for two years. Yeah. Falcons scoop him up. Dan Quinn's gone, where two years ago Quinn was calling the defensive plays. They started 1-7, and they were 31st in EPA. They He relinquishes the play-calling duties to someone else. They go 6-2 and two the remaining eight games, and they were ranked 4th in EPA. Then last year he takes over. He's calling the plays again. He's fired after five games. They're ranked 30th in EPA defensively. Then they actually finished the year 10th, so right. they actually got a lot better after him. So I'm like, all right, Dan Quinn's not there. Arthur Smith is coming in. The Atlanta Falcons last year – they led in five fourth quarters they lost right. games in. And if you look at Pythagorean expected wins versus their actual wins, you go back into since the merger over 40 years ago, it was the third biggest discrepancy we've ever seen. Yeah. Like this team, the underlying metrics, the Falcons were a lot better than their record last year. That's the basic way of saying it. Mm, right. And so all of this stuff is pointing to like positivity. Right. Their first two drives are marching down. They're inside okay. the 10 penalties back them up. They have to kick field goals, but it's like, okay, and they literally just like never moved the ball again. They score six against the Eagles. I have no clue what happened. <laughs> I, again, you can't overreact to right. one game like that. Sure. And then you see how much Tennessee struggled. You're like, yeah, Arthur mm-hmm. Smith, like this all makes sense, right? Right. And then you lose by 100 to the Eagles at home. My Then my last like big brain thought was Eagles, they're elite. Jalen Hurts, MVP, <laughs> plus 400. I think you can get plus 420 some spot. I saw someone send me a ticket. Mm-hmm. Eagles win the NFC East. Mm. they're already one and oh like maybe the eagles are just really good and then the falcons are still average look i was hoping they could win at least seven games for a season win total bet from over the future but uh it's not looking good but that's why i I kind of trying to like save my own like (laughs) face in that regard (laughs) like maybe the eagles are way better than we thought they were the team i know a few people myself included kind of was the least prepared or like confident and trustworthy in my projection and had one of the wider distributions of results as far as they could win 13 games or three. And it really wouldn't surprise Mm -hmm. me. And look, if they stay healthy, they've had some of the worst injury luck in football the last couple of years, they stay healthier. Rigger and Smith as weapons, along with Miles Sanders, Gainwell as the backup running back was fantastic. And then Jalen Hurts making this potential leap. Look, they could just be pretty solid. So anyway, that's, that's like, you always want to be able to think on both sides, whether you have a biased opinion or not. Like I'm hoping Atlanta is just not that bad. Mm-hmm. And I know it's kind of funny to say, okay, maybe the Eagles are just like the best team in the NFC. Yeah. Uh-huh. But like you, it, there's a chance the Eagles are at least really sure. good. And so you have to be open to that. And there's also a chance Atlanta just absolutely stinks and have to be open to that too. Assess well, yeah. it all, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Sure. And, and I'm actually going to stick with another division here in just a second, but we have actually on our regular show, we have coined it the NFC ish. It's somewhere right in between the <laughs> NFC beast of before and the NFC least of last year. We just, we got the football team coming out as the top, but it's just, it's so hard to deduct. Uh, I mean, obviously still, and then now what the football team's going to be without Fitzpatrick, we got to see what Heineke can do for him. So that is a obviously really confusing who is actually going to emerge, who's going to be the worst out of the worst in that. Flip the script a little bit, NFC West, or what some people are already early calling calling the NFC best. Now, uh, 4-0 over the weekend, is there really anything that kind of sets one apart from the other? I mean, I know we had the 49ers try and let the Lions come and sneak in the back door. Uh, the Seahawks never really looked bad against the Colts. And then um, we had the Cardinals absolutely destroy the Titans. Is there really any team that kind of maybe elevated themselves at all? Or are we still kind of question marks entirely in the NFC West? I think, again, you don't want to overreact. Right. So you can't say, oh, now this team is a Super Bowl contender necessarily, outside mm. of maybe if you wanted to say the Rams were anyway. Mm. But you also don't want to uh, like dismiss, like say, the Cardinals' defense. Look, the t- Tennessee Titans' offense was one of the best mm. of the last two years. Arthur Smith or not, they still have a lot of the same personnel. Mm. Like they added Julio Jones. Like, like, like the Cardinals' defense, if they're even just above average with the offense they have – they're a team that we even said before, like when we did previews over the summer, it's kind of crazy that relative to the betting markets, they're the fourth best team in the division. Like right. they're there's like the Cardinals are a really good team. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, from a division perspective, yeah, it's kind of just wild that all four, the way things have lined up, mm. um, you know, if any of them were in the NFC East, they'd be the favorites to win that division. That's just how it is. So <laughs> right. Uh, right. I don't want to dismiss the Cardinals performance, but I'm really worried that Tennessee just could, be much of, more of a mess. Um, mm-hmm. Again, you want to be open to the fact that it was just a fluky one game sample too. And maybe it just, you know, that happens. Um, the one team I would say the Rams in general, um, most people I think were down on the Rams relative to their market, but everyone loved the Stafford signing and what they could do with McVay and they're not very deep. And so they're one or two injuries away, even on the defensive side from, I think taking some pretty big hits and um, they're a team that again, after Seattle blows out Indianapolis on the road, uh, I think that line would have been probably like two and a half, and now you're getting four. There's even a couple four and a halves mm-hmm. on the Colts side at home against the Rams after you see the Rams blow the Bears out on prime time. That's one that's an overreaction um, that's probably worth looking at on the Colts side. Uh, as ugly as it is with Wentz and, and how Indianapolis looked, that's you know sometimes the numbers, just the value is the value. You have to go with it. Um, so that's what I would be maybe more concerned with on that side, on that front. Um just kind of waiting to see what we really get from the Rams. I think defensively they gave up like did Montgomery ran for like, I think over a hundred yards or it was close as a whole. Mm-hmm. The bears were rushing for like six to carry. Maybe it was even higher, yeah. but that's kind of what the Rams do. Brandon Staley before he left for the charges, he implemented this like, Hey, we want to just let you see this box. That's pretty empty. And right. we feel like we can kind of play the ultimate bend. Don't break defense yeah, limit you, you but where you're not gonna be able to throw on us in this era passing has an advantage. You're not going to pass against us. The Bears basically ran it a lot, and they had success. Now, the thing is, is they had some conversions for points and some other drives where they probably could have had more points. Um, So I'm intrigued a little bit, and you saw uh, the over got bet up in that game, and maybe that's something with the Rams you can consider, too, going forward at their totals. I think this one's 47.5, opened 46.5. So maybe the Rams' offense with Stafford obviously taking a leap, but defensively, Maybe there were. So there's different angles you can play it. But uh, that was the one that I think of those four in the division I'm still least certain on is where the Rams end up, I think. In a few weeks, we'll probably know a lot more. I would agree with you there. And I actually had uh, McVay kind of as my early selection for coach of the year. If he could put all those pieces together and, I mean, get Stafford to where I think Stafford can be and actually maybe win a playoff game, I'm sure you would agree. The path is definitely there. So we'll see what happens. But uh Riley, I think we've got about time for one more, and then uh, we'll save uh, a little bit of time here at the Impress and make sure everybody gets uh, all your the Bets TV, uh, all your social media platforms, everything like that, so we can uh, get everybody can get your uh, sought after analysis and insights, my friend. So, Riley, hit them with it, and we'll get on out of here. I guess to close it out, my friend, uh, you know, obviously we talked about the, uh, you know, the rise of sports gambling. Now, eighteen, I believe you said it is the current number of states legalized. Obviously, you know, the majority of the country being legalized is where we go. Is there a ceiling for this industry? And if it's if there's not, then obviously the sky's the limit. But do you think there is any type of ceiling as far as 
you know, I guess I don't know what, that's kind of an open-ended question, but I mean, there's obviously a lot of, you know, sports cast, uh, like gambling casts on TV. That's kind of what the immediate ceiling is, I guess you would say. Is there some ridiculous ceiling that I'm not even thinking about that we could see here in the next 10 to uh, 10 to 15 years? When you mean sports cast, you mean like actual like announcing, of, talking about betting and gambling during right. a so game? Right, so instead of like the Peyton and Eli cast tonight, it would be a uh, actual like gambling type cast. Yeah. I totally forgot about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got to do that with the NBA last year. I did 14 or 15 games. It was just on League Pass. It wasn't like their TNT right. games, right? But right, right. You could go to the League Pass, and instead of watching home or away, you could, there was a third one. It was like the bet cast. I think that's probably just a matter of time. There's that. definitely yeah. a, a high ceiling as far as really any gambler or better that wants to watch a feed where they're talking about the betting and the lines instead of the normal ones. Right. That's just an option for like yeah. every I'm localized that isn't you know, more network. Prominent now. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, I've talked about like someone should just that has time should actually start a platform that does that just like via tw- even if they're just like Twitch feeds, but someone that's like a fan or at least somewhat knowledgeable localized to one team could just stream while they're watching the game and just talk it through that. I mean, I mute most of the time, like when I'm watching games with most announcers anyway, mm-hmm. so um, it would at least be intriguing. And then it's like kind of the centralized like community building localized thing where like, Oh, Hey, I only care about like the Charlotte Hornets games. Cause that's where I live and I'm a Hornets fan, but I were, I'm, you know, wondering about the lines and prop bets and this and that. So you watch the Hornets games and you know, bet cast version. So that's one pathway, one Avenue they've started doing some of it, but uh, that'll grow. It'll still grow as more States just, you know, become mm-hmm. more public. I'm, I'm not sure. It's interesting. I, I would say like, and then a lot of the pitch early on a few years ago was like, Hey, way more people bet on sports than play fantasy. Look how big fantasy got. Mm. So the ceiling for sports should theoretically be way higher. I'm concerned some to some degree that uh, the way the books have engaged with players to this point hasn't necessarily been uh, as player friendly as we would have hoped. Uh, a couple of examples, books limiting sharp play like immediately where – you know, you, you can bet a few thousand on a game or whatever it may be. And then the next time you go to bet it, it's like $19 limits. Mm-hmm. They basically are just saying, hey, we don't want your your action, which is obviously um, not great for people that right. are trying to bet professionally or for a living. Mm-hmm. Uh, second, you have a lot of lines that are like minus 112 on each side or minus 114 each way. Like it's hard enough for most recreational players to even break even at minus right. 110. Like, and now you have to lay minus 112 or minus 114 or live. You'll see minus 118 each side if you're in game betting and just, you know, some action. Like, that's not very player friendly. Like, how are we going to really explode to the point where this is like mass adoption if we're not catering um, to the actual players? And you'd think that these books would have some sort of like contest head to head with each other to try to offer the best opportunity. And there's some books that I think do a better job than others. Um, some of them, it's harder for them to scale because they're not FanDuel or DraftKings. And so it'll take them some time. Um, but I think they will scale eventually. Or FanDuel, DraftKings types will just have to adjust what they're doing. So maybe that's why it's minus 114 sometimes on both sides, is they know they can just get away with it for now. Um, but I think the ceiling is limited until they really are more player friendly, whether it's sharp action or recreational action. Um, otherwise, like I think it might end up being kind of like what DFS was, where it boomed. Everyone was playing. 99% lost their money and they're like, why am I going to keep playing? I never win. Right. It's like, no mm-hmm. one's ever going to win live betting minus 118 when they're mm-hmm. just betting for fun. Like after a year or two, you're just going to be done. You're like, why am I, why am I donating money? I'd rather <laughs> use it on something else. So yeah, right. that's the direction it could go if we don't find ways to kind of intervene, but it's super early in the space. There's obviously a ton of projects in the works and ideas getting formed. And I think there's a way to figure it out in the U S but for now, um, I think the ceiling is actually more capped than I would have said maybe two years ago. Okay. All right. And something you said there um, right at the end, one kind of final, it's a little segue onto this question before we uh, get you out of here, Preston. What, uh, with you kind of being on the inside uh, a little bit deeper than we are, what what's that next move? What's What's that next step that the sports gambling industry takes? Are we talking live embedding in uh in stadiums is that too far is that too lofty now or something maybe even to kind of expand mobilize betting more is, is there another big move coming soon or are we kind of just at a plateau for now i'll be honest i don't actually really talk to anyone that would be able to tell you this <laughs> stuff so i won't hey, i appreciate your candor <laughs> yeah i won't pretend to like like oh this is the next big thing like i don't know look it's just a matter of time before it's in stadiums i believe there was a 
was it a Washington Wizards game late in the NBA last year where they actually put a sports book in the Wizards yeah. arena. And like the last week you could go and make bets while you were there. You, I'm sure you could do it from your mobile device as well if you had signed up and do that. Like, yeah, that's probably just a matter of time. Um, and it already has started. But eventually, yeah, every state that is legalized, there sh- they should be offering betting to everyone while they're at the games, right? right so, right. Um, yeah, that's definitely a, a, an avenue, a pathway. I'm not sure if it's necessarily the next focus. I think they're still trying to, like, for example, I'm in California. California is not legalized yet. Like, they got to get New York, Texas, and California. And, you know, this blows up, you know, multiple fold. What it, now, New Jersey gets a lot of the New York action probably anyway at mm. the current moment. But regardless, like, those are the three biggest states, and they're not even legal yet. So I think they're focused on making sure we get to, if it's 40-something that are, like, for sure locked in long term, then they can start kind of toying with, like, you know, the perks and how to cater to the player better on this side and that front. So um, it's a good question, though. I, I just don't talk enough to, like, the, the yeah. authorities on legalization <laughs> or, or I was like, hoping. development. You know, hey, well, well, I appreciate that, though, Preston, nonetheless, my friend. Um, outside of that, that's about all I got. We're just a little bit over uh, 30 minutes here, right in between 30, 45 minutes. So that's about uh, all either of us got. Before uh, we close it officially out here, Preston, get you out of here, get to uh, Monday Night Football at the time of recording. Um, please indulge us. Where can we find um, all of your main content? I know I mentioned Bets TV. if you want to explain that just a little bit um, more in depth. And then uh, any other content you'd like to uh, make our audience and anybody else who might stumble upon this video aware of. Sure. Yeah. I mean, most of it just goes on my Twitter feed. We stream every day and people can watch it there through the tweet embedded video. Uh, or you can go to the youtube.com slash bets TV page. We have a Twitch page. Uh, regardless, the, the idea I do, I do two shows every day and they're more interactive. They're a little different than like a lot of the shows you see where they're just like breaking down games X, Y, and Z. This is why I like X, Y, you know, this is kind mm-hmm. of the mundane, saturated sports betting talk that uh, I kind of wanted to veer away from and do more engagement with the audience. And so I, I actually take calls. The first show I do called Last Word Cheetah every day at four Eastern, one Pacific. I take your calls. We talk through your bets. I tell you if I agree, disagree. If you guys have questions, you ask me. I'm kind of like, you know, the expert, so to speak, quotation marks. But I can at least say like, hey, this is a reference point. Like, hey, my number on this game is this. So I slightly agree with your side or no, I definitely disagree. This is why. Um, and then we track it throughout the month. And so we actually give away money to the callers that have the best ROI. Um, we've given away like $2,300, I think, the last three months. So it's usually like a seven hundred, seven to $800 price pull at the end of the month. In a, so those that are doing well can actually win some cash on top of it. And then the second show kind of to up the ante on giving away money to people that can make correct picks. Uh, it's called Who Wants to Be a Betting Extraordinaire? It's that next hour, 5 Eastern, 2 Pacific. And we basically have a, a day one question everyone can call in and try to make a pick. If they're right, they get to call back for day two and ladder up. If you make a pick correctly in seven straight days, you win $25,000. Day three, you can get 250 bucks. Day five, you get 2,500. So there's a little bit of a a ladder, but yeah, it's just kind of free money, free picks. People can kind of take their shot at them and the engagement's fun. It's just fun to kind of talk through betting from that scope, as opposed to just always so analytical and, and like, based on if you win or lose if you're the person that's giving out the picks all the time and like i have done that plenty in the last five six seven years so i was like let's just do something that's less stress for me more fun for the audience and yeah. giving sure. away cash is pretty cool too so <laughs> sure. people feel free to call in whenever they want 661-515 bets is the line every day for eastern one pacific Awesome. Awesome. And then you are at Sports Cheetah on Twitter and then uh, any other social media outlets you're on mainly? Yeah, mostly just Twitter. Instagram, technically, it's the same handle. But yeah, uh, yeah you can just find me there. Cool. Awesome. Well, uh, once again, Preston, the legendary sports cheetah himself. Thank you so much, my friend, uh, for stopping by. Like I said, uh, did our best not to fanboy out here. Uh, We can't tell you how much we appreciate you uh, coming on and sharing some wise words with us and uh, hopefully starting a long term connection. We'd love to have you on again some point in the future and uh, definitely pick your brain a little bit more in depth. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Well, you have a spectacular Monday, my friend, and uh, we wish you a winning Monday on uh, Monday Night Football here, three Mondays in a row there. And to all of you who tuned in to episode number two of the Wise Words podcast, 
Thank you so much. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it from the bottom of our hearts. You know the drill. It only helps us make TTL Sports Media bigger and better for each and every one of you. Last but certainly not least, we hope you have a spectacular rest of your Wednesday. Unless you have any other plans, let's cash some tickets.